Hello, it's time for another round of phono cartridge testing. A viewer suggested I should take a look at the Audio Technica AT3600L, and this is a very affordable budget cartridge, so I thought that was a good idea. Have a look at here, it's fairly plain looking, and it is very cheap, so I only paid $15 for mine, and I'll be comparing it to the Audio Technica AT95E. So the AT 3600L comes in a very plain box. There's some foam inside to hold the cartridge and a couple of screws, that's it. Doesn't come with any spec sheets or manuals or anything. Whereas the AT95 comes in a proper box with uh, instructions and everything. Anyway, let's have a look at the specs and see how these two cartridges compare. So Audio Technica themselves do not actually publish the specs for the AT3600L on their website and actually they don't sell it to consumers, they only sell them directly to turntable manufacturers, but you can find shops online that uh, are happy to sell them. However, the specs I have here might not be 100% correct, they are gathered from a number of websites, but let's run through them and do a quick comparison. So both cartridges are moving magnet, and the output voltage at 1 kHz with a standard 5 cm per second groove is specified anywhere from 2.5 millivolts up to 4.2 millivolt. That's a bit lower than the standard 5 millivolt for moving magnet cartridges. And the same with the Audio Technica, 3.5 millivolt is also a bit below the standard output voltage. Challenge balance, 1.5 dB. Well, that sounds good. And 2 dB for the AT95E. And then we have channel separation. So here we have two figures, 1 kHz, 24 dB, 10 kHz, 15 dB. And the Audio Technica, well, I did a measurement of that already. And we know 1 kHz, I got a result of around 24 dB, I think. But at 10 kHz, I got around the same 15 dB. So that's probably realistic. Then we have the frequency response, 20 Hz, 20 kHz for both of them. Uh, not very useful without knowing the deviation and compliance. I was not able to find any figures on the compliance for this cartridge. So the compliant basically means how stiff is the suspension of the cantilever in the cartridge here. So that's quite important when you're matching a cartridge to a tone arm. But my estimate based on testing the cartridge says it's somewhere around medium to low compliance. So it's probably very close to the same as the 1895 here. Some people say the L in the 3600 here stands for low compliance that might be correct and then we have tracking force how much weight we're going to put on the cartridge it's specified from 2.5 up to 3.5 grams and it's a bit more than the 1895 only 1.5 up to 2.5 grams so this is a little bit higher than average for moving magnet cartridges but it's really not a big deal and then we have the weight of the cartridge 5.7 grams, so it's a little bit lighter than the 1895. That should be fine, shouldn't cause any issues with any arms. And then we have the stylus type, so it is a different type than the 1895. This one is a 0.6mm conical diamond, whereas we have elliptical on the 1895E. So generally, elliptical is considered superior to conical, but it really depends on the implementation. And if you're concerned about record wear with the slightly higher tracking force, then general consensus is that conical diamond will have less wear on the record. So if we put two gram on the 1895E with the elliptical diamond, it will probably have about the same wear as three grams on the conical diamond here. And then we have recommended loading, 47 kilo ohm over here on the 1895. I didn't find any specs on the AT3600L but this is very standard 47 kilo ohms. I will expect it to be the same here. And the same with the low capacitance, 100 to 200 picofarad. Uh, it's a very standard figure. So I will expect the same to be true over here. And then we have the cost of the cartridge. So I've seen them anywhere from $15 up to $25, of course, without a head shell, but it is very cheap. Replacement stylus, the only ones I were able to find were around $25 and it seems to be a bit high when you can get a new cartridge for $15. But anyway, it's understandable that the replacement stylus shops needs to make a little bit of profit to keep the door open. So a slightly unusual feature of this cartridge here is that the cantilever is made out of carbon, they say. 
I don't know if that means it's actually made of carbon or it's made of some kind of resin filled with carbon powder. I don't think it's carbon fiber because they would have mentioned that and doesn't look like carbon fiber, but it's some kind of carbon material. I'm not quite sure what the advantage should be, but we have seen a lot of exotic materials used for the cantilever, uh, boron, beryllium, and ruby, but the standard is just an aluminium cantilever like we have on the 1895E. Since the spec for the output level was all over the place with values from 2.5 millivolt up to 4.2 millivolt, I decided to do my own measurement. So this is direct measure of the cartridge playing back a test record with a 5 centimeters per second groove at 1 kilohertz. And the figure I get is 2.8 millivolt. I can't guarantee that this is 100% correct because it is difficult to measure with the small AC signals, but it's going to be fairly close. So. 2.8 millivolt, it's fairly low, so be prepared to turn the volume up a little bit extra uh, compared to what you do with other cartridges. And I think it's worth mentioning that Rega, the turntable manufacturer, uh, sells a rebranded version of the same cartridge, so it definitely look exactly the same, uh, just with the Rega name, Rega Carbon on the front instead of the Audio Technica logo. Whether it's 100% identical, I can't say, but it definitely looks the same. And they charge $65 for their rebranded version, so quite a bit more expensive. All the details and specs they have on it sounds about the same as the Audio Technica carbon cantilever, conical diamond, can replace the stylus tracking 2 to 3 grams, and output 2.5 millivolts, that matches fairly well with the 2.8 millivolts I measured. So I think it's just worth mentioning. Okay, it's time to talk about the actual test results. So I'll be doing three tests. Frequency response, channel separation, and harmonic distortion. To perform these tests, I'm using the two test records you see here. I use the autophone for frequency response and channel separation, as it's got frequency sweeps all the way from 800 Hz up to 50 kHz. And then I use the Hi-Fi News record for distortion measurements. Doing all the tests, I use the Chitmani phone amplifier, because it's low noise, low distortion, and I know it's got a frequency response within 0.5 dB across the whole frequency range. And the input impedance is 47 kilo ohm plus 15 to 20 picofarad. So it's pretty much ideal for these measurements. And the turntable I'm using is a Yamaha GT750. Uh, it's a pretty decent direct drive turntable with a very large platter. And it's got an arm with all the adjustments needed for optimal cartridge performance. Before running the test, I've been using the cartridge for around 15 to 20 hours, uh, just to make sure it's reached its optimal performance. And I perform all the tests multiple times to make sure I get consistent results. First, we have the frequency response measurement. And here we're going from one kilohertz up to 30 kilohertz. And the first thing we notice here is that there's quite a bump here centered around probably 13, 14 kilohertz. This bump looks like it reaches something like three and a half, four dB. And we can also see there's a little bit more difference between the two channels uh, already at one kilohertz. So as part of my cartridge setup and alignment procedure, I try to get both channels to perform equally well. However, on this cartridge, there's a little bit more difference between the two channels than on the cartridges I've tested previously. Maybe the tolerances are not quite as tight. And I should mention, this is done with a load of 47 kilo ohm in parallel with 150 picofarad. So this is a very standard load for a phono cartridge. And if we compare to the 1895E, we can see it's a bit more well behaved. It does have a slight rise towards the high frequencies, but it's only a couple of dB. And the two channels are very well matched. So it is possible to smooth out this bump a little bit by changing the loading but it's gonna be up to you to decide whether that's worth doing or not. If you're interested, you can view one of my previous videos uh, where I've showed some examples of what happens to the frequency response when we change the loading, both the impedance and the capacitance. Next, we have channel separation. So channel separation basically tells us how good we can expect the stereo imaging to be. Here we want the value to be as high as possible meaning better separation between the left and the right channel. 
And it's worth noting when I do these measurements, I test both left to right channel separation and right channel to left channel separation. And what I plot here is the worst case. So looking at the data, it starts out quite nicely, maybe 24 dB, like it was promised in the specs at one kilohertz. And it's okay up to about three kilohertz, but then it starts going downhill down to somewhere around 16 dB at 10 kilohertz. So very close to the specs, it's at 15 dB at 10 kilohertz. So that's very correct. However, it continues going down and we're all the way down to like six, seven dB at 20 kilohertz. So don't expect excellent stereo imaging from this cartridge here. If we look at the AT95E, it's very similar. It comes from like two kilohertz and then it starts going down, 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 15 dB at eight kilohertz. And then it recovers a little bit again but while it is slightly better than the 3600, uh, it's still not a great result for the AT95E. It is one of its weakest points. So ideally we would like better channel separation. Then we have distortion and very high distortion at high frequencies is fairly typical for formal cartridges. And if we look at the numbers here, it starts out quite well, just above 0.3% at 100 Hertz, but it continues rising and we reach 1% distortion at about 1 kilohertz, and then it starts rising more and more, 2 kilohertz, 2%, 5 kilohertz, we are above 6% distortion, and it actually goes outside the graph here, but the number at 10 kilohertz was about 15% distortion, so quite high distortion. The AT95E is slightly better, well, not at the lower frequencies, but uh, you see it reaches 1% at 800 hertz but once you go up in the higher frequencies it performs slightly better that's probably due to the elliptical stylus compared to the conical stylus so this might be a little bit shocking for people when you read distortion specs for your amplifier or your cd player it might say like 0 0.001 percent across the whole spectrum and then suddenly here we have 10 15 percent distortion from a phono cartridge but this is real distortion and it is typical for phonal cartridges and the rising distortion with frequency is of course because it's harder for the stylus to follow the groove once it starts getting more extreme in frequencies however there is a redeeming factor once we look at the spectrum of the distortion so what we have here is a spectrum of one of the tones of a distortion measurement and the first the big one we have here is the fundamental tone. Then we have the second harmonic distortion, third harmonic distortion, fourth harmonic distortion, probably a fifth harmonic down here somewhere. And we can see it's very much dominated by the second harmonic distortion. Odd harmonic or the third harmonic distortion is quite a lot lower in level. So typically even harmonic or second harmonic distortion sounds a lot better than third harmonic distortion. So most people describe second harmonic distortion added to music it just adds a little bit of warmth to the music whereas if it's dominated by third harmonic distortion then it sounds pretty awful that probably explains why records can sound pretty good despite the high distortion so what do i think they sound like well i spent quite a few hours listening to records played back on both cartridges and i think the AT3600L is very well balanced and it sounds pretty good, but I slightly prefer the sound of the AT95E. But this is of course subjective and based on personal preferences. So would I recommend any of these cartridges? Well, the AT95E I mostly added for comparison and I previously recommended it as a solid budget cartridge. So let's talk about the 3600L. Yes, I absolutely recommend this cartridge. As $15, it's exceptional good value for money. And I mean, it costs less than one new vinyl record. So if you're on a tight budget, this is a great choice. Or maybe you just inherited an old record player from the 80s with a bunch of records, uh, but the stylus is a bit worn out, or maybe it's broken, and you just want to listen to some records, then absolutely, this is a great cartridge to go for. Or maybe you're having some friends over for a party and a few beers and listening to some music and you don't want to damage your new $500 moving call cartridge. So it was probably a good idea to have one of these spares so you can put in your record player. 
or perhaps you just want to have another cartridge to play around with. So I say less than $20, you can't go wrong with this cartridge. So that's it for this review. I hope you enjoyed it and found it useful. It's unlikely I'll be doing reviews of expensive formal cartridges as this is just a hobby thing and it's not likely I'm going to spend hundreds of dollars on a cartridge unless it's something I really want for myself. But if you have any suggestions for budget cartridges you would like me to review and measure, I'll just leave a comment. So anyway, thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more content and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.